Hey everybody, JJ here, back again for another Saturday at Zoom Networking. Today's guest speaker is an awesome young man. Have 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 had the pleasure to meet him in person. Um, he's out of Amy Majoy's Raising Private Money Group RPM. He is um, got a really interesting background. So hopefully, you guys are not uh, speeding on the highways out there. This young man might be pulling you over sometime soon. Uh, <laughs> our good friend, my, my good friend, and our guest speaker today, Mr. Chris Champa. Chris, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, brother. So, hey, let me, let me ask you, um, for those that don't know you, where in the country are you located? I'm located in Auburn, California, which is out here in uh, just east of Sacramento area. So I actually know a couple of pe people on the line. I know Cynthia, Allison, and, and Aaron. So uh, it's good to see some familiar faces. Hello, everybody. Cool. So, um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about real estate. You know, obviously, we've met through Amy's group. Amy Mentori is wonderful. She's one of the premier geniuses in the country when it comes to raising private money. And her RPM group, Standing for Raising Private Money, is uh, where you where you, you and I met. Um, but, you know, we all get a different start into real estate. We don't all start at the same time. We don't all start at the same place. We don't all have the same path. Um, I take things, I'll, I like to take things back to the time when we're, you know, learning to drive and, and, and voting and becoming an adult, and ideally maybe getting in, into the work world. Um, was real estate something that was introduced to you early on? Like was mom and agent and dad a contractor or what were you doing maybe in your teens, getting into your twenties? Is that, is that when you started your current career? Yeah. So real, real estate was not introduced to me. I mean, it was introduced to me young simply because as a summer job in high school, I was working construction and I think I weighed uh, a buck and some change uh, at the moment, you know, and uh, I don't weigh much more now. Uh, I think I was the same size all the way through. Um, but, uh, you know, I was just working construction and they would laugh at me because I couldn't even carry a wheelbarrow full of cement without tipping it over. Uh, so, uh, but that's that's the only exposure I had to real estate other than I just knew I liked it. I don't know why I liked it. I don't know how. I just think I saw it on late night TV and saw people making money with it. And I was like, maybe that's, maybe that's why I like it. Yeah. I think houses are just cool, you know, real estate, yeah, same. commercial buildings, you know. I remember being, as a kid, you'll see big houses and wonder, who lives in that house? Oh, my God, look yeah. at that thing. <laughs> I still do that. I still drive by me, but that's a cool house, man. I wonder who lives there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I was up in Carmel recently, you know, went up to San Francisco, the Bay Area, went to go see an Oakland A's game. But, um we stopped in Carmel. There were some beautiful houses right on the water course. Carmel. Yep, you know, they absolutely. Go A's. I'm a big I'm a big A's fan. So I, I haven't uh, haven't been to a game in like ten plus years, but uh, I'm a big A's fan. I just got a new A's hat right there in the ballpark. It was pretty pleased. Oh boy. Yeah. So um, now I want to talk about your your background now. Is that all right? What what you're doing? Absolutely. With let's let's do it. So now. Uh, getting from your teens, when did you start the career that you're currently in? I started this career, so I'm in law enforcement. So uh, I absolutely love what I do, but I started this career late. So I started this career probably in my mid 30s. Um, so I date, dating myself a bit, uh, or my early 30s, I should say. I've been in law enforcement now, going on 17 years, uh, and it has flown by. Uh, but before that. Um, you know, I was in I was in corporate America. So I worked in corporate America at Intel Corporation uh, for about eight or nine years before kind of hanging it up and, and saying, you know, I don't want to I don't want to do this anymore. I want to go into something fun. And I think law enforcement was for me. So that's kind of how I got into this profession as we sit. That's great. And I know yeah. that was available to me. I might have gone the same path. You know, I just, yeah. <laughs> I know right. You got to do early on, so to speak. Yeah, no. So I, I joined as, as as an old guy, so to speak. So you know, you go from you go from corporate America to getting yelled at, getting screamed at, you know, working out every day, um, you know, posting up and saluting and doing all that kind of stuff. It's just it's definitely a shock to the system for sure. Now, as far as your your real estate activity. Um, and raising private money is, is this new to you or how long have you how long have you, how did when did you transfer actually kind of into becoming an investor uh yeah. are good, you in good question group or is, is that is that 
how you yeah, so, it, so it, it is new the raising private money is new to me so i've only been doing it let's see i joined amy's group last april um back in long beach in april so what's that i don't know eight months or so maybe nine months i don't know maybe maybe even over a year i don't think it's been over a year i know it hasn't been over a year um but yeah no it so it, I had no idea pri raising private money that I could even do it, right? So we started this real estate thing when I was at Intel. My wife and I were like, hey, we have some disposable income. We should we should buy a house and flip it. And we didn't know what the heck we were doing, um, but we did it. And we were lucky. We made money. Uh, and we did it a few times. Uh, and then we decided that we'd become landlords because everybody says once you make some money, you got to buy a rental. Uh, and I didn't even really know who they was yet at the time. And so we did that. And we became a landlord and some of it was good and some of it was absolutely horrible uh, because I didn't use property manager. So it was me uh, and my wife. So that was that was a terrible experience that I never want to relive. Um, but, you know, raising private money, I, I didn't even know anything about it. Didn't think I could do it, but I was already doing it like two and three years ago and four years ago and just didn't even know it um, because my dad was my original private money lender. So we were doing a flip. And my dad, for some reason, he was like, what are you, what are you doing? And I told him, and we had actually uh, already put the money down, and we had money for the rehab. And he said, well, here's some money. Just put it in the bank because I just want to make sure that you and you and Nikki and the kids, just in case anything happens, that you guys are good. I was like, Dad, I don't, I don't need it. Like, we're good. We have it all budgeted. You know, this is all planned out. And so he gave me some money, and I put it in the bank, and I told him I didn't need it. And then when we sold the house and made money, I gave him it back but I gave them 10% interest because uh, that's what I had kind of been told. Yeah. Um, like when you borrow money, you pay them back with interest. And so he kind of raised his eyebrows like, this is too much. What are you doing? And I said, well, this is, this is what we're supposed to do. Right. I give you interest if you lend me money. And so then he kind of perked himself up. He's like, well, can, can I do this again? Right. And so he was, it, it's like, it's like, you know, like, like drugs, you know, like uh, the first one's on me, you know? So, uh, he was hooked. So I, I was doing it. He was my first private money lender, and neither one of us knew that uh, what private money really was at the time. So that's that's kind of how it all got started. Awesome. So um, you actually got got a podcast you're putting together or a YouTube channel? Yeah. So I just started out with that. So it's uh, I call it I refer to it as Dumb and Dumber, but um, it's me and my partner Andy. Uh, we met years a uh, year or so back uh, in another mastermind but it's called the donut shop cop uh, ironically because i'm a cop and uh i love donuts because i'm a little fat kid so i love donuts so it's called donut shop cop uh, the podcast uh, we do have a small youtube channel so feel free to go out and, and like it subscribe to it uh tell us we're dumb tell us you don't like it or just have a donut on me i don't doesn't matter to me um, but my really my goal uh, since we've kind of been successful the last couple of years in our business is to help other cops, especially since I got into raising private money is how can I help young cops, middle-aged cops, old cops? Uh, how do I, how do I get them interested in investing in real estate? And, you know, they don't have to have hundreds of thousands of dollars to do it. So I've been able to help some cops with 25 K uh, even one cop with 10 K. Um, and some have a lot more than that too. Some, some of them have a hundred K and 200 K. You just, you really never know, but, my goal is really to educate them and show them that they can make 10, 12, 15% on their money simply by not leaving it in the bank. We just like to have fun. We're not trying to be coaches. We're not trying to give advice. I'm not a CPA. I'm not an attorney. I'm just a, a, a dumb, a dumb cop that, you know, put in some hard work and was very fortunate. Yeah. You know, that, that's kind of what I do, man. It's the same thing. It's just, you know, I'm not the smartest, sharpest pencil in the box, but, um, <laughs> I'm not the dullest either. It's just, you know, to have fun with social media guys, you know, for whatever you're doing, you know, uh, do a video. If you follow Pace Morby, it all talks about, you know, do a video on Instagram or, you know, have a YouTube channel, uh, use stories, use reels. Uh, and so what you're doing, Chris, is great, but I, I invite you and I think we've talked about this to post all your content to my group and let my group know who you are so they can support you. Um, yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate that. And I definitely will. You know, anybody I can help, I will. So, uh, yeah, just just keep going. You're you're on the right path and I think you're doing great things. So let me ask you now, now that you're, you're pretty much jumping in, you're helping other officers, you're doing the raising private money thing. What do you find has been one of your biggest hurdles in the beginning that you might have overcome 
or maybe one of your hurdles that you're still dealing with? Uh, you know, I think just the biggest hurdle to overcome is just the misperception that uh, that it's only open to the wealthy, right? In order to be a private money lender, you have to have a couple hundred thousand dollars, uh, which isn't always the case, right? Just breaking down that barrier. Um, you know, there are smaller deals that people can get involved in. I don't do syndications. I don't do funds. I don't touch any of that. Um, I do. I'm very small time. I literally just it's it's my wife and I. That's our business. You know, so we pair one investor with one deal. And so, you know, the biggest thing and the hardest challenge has been, you know, finding those deals that are in the 10 to thirty five thousand dollar range. And they're out there, um, but they're probably like the subject to deals that I do, you know, where it's a lower barrier of entry into the into that realm. But really that I mean, finding the, that low of investment, it's not hard. It just takes a little bit more time. But the bigger thing is just overcoming the fear, right? People are just, they're not educated and that's what their fear comes from. Their fear comes from perception. Their fear comes from, oh, what, what if the real estate market crashes? Well, you know, none of us can control that, but we can control what we invest in. And I can control how much I pay for a house, how much I pay it to rehab it and how much I sell it for. Um, and since we buy them so low, you know, it's even if the market tank, we can, we can still recoup our investment. Cool. No, that's great. Um, so now, are you are actually connecting investors with potential projects, or you so you you're doing that with your police officer buddies? Yes, and I, I do with everybody. So I've got family, friends. I've got uh, random folks that have seen me on social media now and see me on the podcast, or you know, been introduced to somebody through somebody else. So you know, now we've kind of branched out our network just in the last, I'd say, eight months. You know, I've I've connected more than two million dollars worth of worth of investments uh, with a very core group of investors. So, uh, you know, that's the other question I get a lot is, Hey, you know, someone sends me a random email that I don't even really know says, Hey, I've got this, this flip in this city, you know, will you help me raise 200 K? Well, the initial answer is no, because I don't know you. Um, so if I don't know you, I'm not going to work with you. I have to trust you. There has to be this relationship. I have to know that your values match my values. Um, I have to know that you're not just some fly by night investor. Right. I, so the answer is no, I, I work with like five investors that I trust my money with. Um, I would trust my family's money with, obviously I would trust my cops money with. Right. So if you and I haven't met and have that bond and that relationship, the answer is no, I, I'm not going to raise money for you. Cause I don't do syndications. I don't do funds. So I play somebody I trust with somebody I trust. Right. And, and that's really the that's really the nit and dirty of it. That's great. That's great. So let me ask you, now that you've been doing this for a while, uh, I, I'm assuming there are different types of loan amounts that you've been dealing with. There are different types of um, monies that have been forwarded for investment and there are different types of projects. Um, is there one blanket kind of document or is there a generic document that gets filled in with variances? Yeah, or good, great question. Yeah. So every every investment and investor I work with, uh, if you don't secure, protect and insure the investment, then I'm not going to refer anybody to you. And what that means is um, basically uh, basically protect it. So we're going to do a promissory note, which is basically a contract that says, hey, you know, JJ, I agree to lend you one hundred thousand dollars at 15 percent for 12 months APR. And this is what the payments are going to look like or it's going to be a lump sum paid on this date. Um, and then once we have that document signed and notarized, then we're going to actually take it. And we're going to get you a lien position. So you're either going to be in a first lien position or a second lien position at worst, um, because we don't do, you know, two, three and four people on every deal. We do one, maybe two people on a deal. Um, and so we will also give you a lien position, which actually secures now your investment that has a promissory note attached to it. And then we're also going to add you as an additional insurer on the policy. So. It's basically a builder's risk insurance that everybody gets currently when they do a rehab. Um, you know, I'll add my investor's name on it. That way, if, you know, Mother Nature takes its toll and, you know, something happens to it, then they still are an insured on that and they still have a, a, a way to recoup their cost. There you go. So as you're doing different types of transactions, um, people are obviously, as you were saying earlier, coming back and they're, they're lending again and again. And are they all single family or now doing some multifamily? You are yeah, good, good question. Yeah. So now, now we've grown exponentially because obviously, 
you know, when, when we first get an investor and we strike up that relationship, I always like to ask them what their goal is, right? What, what are they looking to get out of this, right? And some people, some people like rehabs or flips. Some people like to, you know, the multifamily prospect to where they can park their money for 24, 36 months or even five years uh, and get a consistent mailbox money type of flow. Um, you know, and other people, they have a small amount. So I've been successful in kind of buying some long-term stuff. So I've done some subject twos where, you know, I only need 10 K to come into it. And so basically what I do is with the subject two is, you know, I'll either take their 10 K as a down payment and I'll give them 12 months interest on that. Or if it's a bigger amount, I've even done a subject two in a long-term rental where an investor said, Hey, here's 40 K. Um, and I basically gave them 40% of the property. So they get 40% of the equity, 40% of the appreciation, and 40% of the depreciation as well, in addition to the cash flow. So they've actually become a, a financial partner, so to speak. So yeah, we've we've done all kinds of things now. We've got apartment complexes, we've got long-term rentals, we've done uh, three or four subject twos, uh, and we're currently working on a flip, but we've done probably four or five flips. But the flips are usually the most popular um, just because it's a, it's a quick hit in and out usually for someone just getting started in private money lending. You know, it's... It's kind of that eight to six to six to eight to ten month range. So, now you mentioned earlier that you're in Northern California. Are all the projects that you work with there, or you nope. yeah, in fact, most of them, yeah, most of them are outside of California because I've got uh, one partner that lives uh, really. I'm really close with. He lives in Georgia, and he also works in Texas. Uh, and I've got my other partner, um, business partner that we've done quite a few deals with. He's in uh, Denver, Colorado. And then I've got another partner that actually has uh, one partner, but he's got two different businesses, one in San Francisco and one in the D.C. area. Um, and then just a slew of, of other partners that are in Florida and whatnot, too. So, um, you know, most of them are outside of California. It just so happens I'm currently working a deal uh, in Auburn right now uh, that I raised 275 k for. Um, so it's, it's a quick little flip that's already pre-sold. So, uh, but yeah, most of them are outside of California. Cool. That's great. That's great. Is this common or uncommon that these projects would be pre-sold? I mean, is, is, that, it's usually uncommon, right? That, that That's uncommon, but, uh, this one's kind of a, an interesting story. So, uh, not that anyone cares, but my son, uh, he's a fireman and he's just getting started at his young age and, uh, rather than rent, I kept telling him like, hey, let's find a place we can buy and we can fix up together, you know, that sort of thing, because he's been saving up. And so uh, he basically started approaching me with all these deals. He kept sending me all these deals. And um, he's like, how about this one, Dad? How about this one? And I was like, no, no, no. And then uh, finally we found one and uh, he's pre-qualified for a loan. So the business bought it. Uh, the business is going to rehab it. So we raised uh, 275K to buy it. So we're going to pay some folks some 15% interest on their money. Uh, we've already got a contractor lined up. And in about four months, uh, he's going to buy it from the business. The business will make some money. But obviously, he's going to get a screaming deal on it um, because he's my son. So uh, that one's odd uh, that it is pre-sold. Cynthia Ware, you are on with Mr. Chris <laughs> What's up, girl? You're all good. You're all good. No, okay. you good, Cynthia. Good to see you again. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I have a question, and that it was just off of what you just said. Your son brought a deal, brought a deal, brought another deal. So what helps you determine what deal you're going to financially support with raising private money? That's a good question. So if I'm raising it for somebody else, it's the trust. So you and I have to know each other, right? So you and I know each other, Cynthia. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it has to I have to know that you have more deals coming. Right. And that you have a continual flow of deals that this isn't just a one time thing. And you're, um, you know, either new or just really don't know what you're doing. But my son, you know, in terms of how do I know it was a deal? Just basically running the numbers. Right. I was a fortune builder uh, back in the day okay. as well. That's how I first met Amy. So uh, I know that's how I know Aaron uh, that's on the call as well. He's a fortune builder we've met before. So. You know, that that's really my foundation. So the project has to make financial sense for us. Okay. Um, so I didn't know you was a fortune builder. I'm a fortune builder, too. I didn't, yes, I ma'am. That's, yeah. that's where we got the start and we got all our systems and they showed okay. us everything we were doing wrong and all the mistakes <laughs> we were making. 
Okay. And so I, I got a question because I know we we paired up in conversation last year and you had a pro portfolio. Okay. And so I, I, I touch back at you to ask you, what was the exit strategy on the portfolio? What did you end up doing? Because um, that's just part of real estate. You know, yep. I, I'm, I'm, I've had three portfolios come across my lap, but I don't know what to do with it. You know? Right. Just... Yeah. We actually got lucky on that one. So, I, and I say lucky because we truly did get lucky. Um, so basically we were negotiating. It was a, I think a 14 or 16 home portfolio, multifamily uh, out in the St. Louis area started doing our due diligence and uh, it really turned out to be not a good deal, right? The owner, the homes were not in the condition the owner said they were in. Um, he was asking way too much money. And so I went back and he's like, no, I can't take that much money or that little money. And so I said, okay, well I walked. And so we actually had got, we had already gotten uh, eight of the homes inspected. So I was already out some money, but because of the inspections, I saved hundreds of thousands of dollars of a mistake. So I'll take the $3,000 loss any day of the week because I didn't lose 80 or 100 or 150 once we got into it. And so uh, lo and behold, Cynthia, you won't believe it, but the seller came back to me uh, about seven or eight weeks later and said, hey, I've been thinking about this. Do you, are you still interested? And I said, no, man, like your, your price is ridiculous. I can't pay that. You're crazy. And he said, well, what can you pay? And I said, well, and so I went through the whole thing again. I said, well, here's what I can pay. And so um, I, I gave him a realistic number. And uh, he's like, all right, well, if you can do that, uh, I'll take it. And so since I had already been meeting with him and I had investors lined up and I had other people that on my team that were interested in this these properties, um, I actually picked it up and I actually turned it and wholesaled it right to another investor before I even closed extra. Ah, so, great. Um, you know, everybody, everybody won in that situation. Uh, I didn't feel like managing 16 homes. So uh, I sold it off, uh, made a quick buck. And uh, I think right now, I last I checked, the investor is sitting fat and happy. He's he's loving it. Every house is rented. So that's nice. OK, I'm looking at a, a diamond in the rough. It's a three layer house with a basement and it's a diamond in the rough. Gotcha. Yeah. So I'm uh, in the St. Louis area. All I'm looking for now are subject to. So uh, I'm not doing any rehab. So if you find any of those, let me know. OK, I will. I will. Thank you. It's good seeing you. Yeah, it's good, good seeing you, Cynthia. You look good, us. girl. You look good. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. You know, I think for me, one of the biggest pluses of what we do with the people, you know, many people like Cynthia, many people like yourself, um, I call it squeezing the juice from the orange, you know, whatever program we're in, are we meeting the people? Are we building the relationships? Because if we're not, then we're not building our business. Right. Um, so let me ask you, besides Amy, we met through Amy Majori. She's got her RPM program. Uh, besides Amy, who else has been a huge influence, a, a huge impact, a mentor, someone that's really, maybe a couple of people that have really sort of, uh, you know, helped get you going? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, I, I interact with everybody because, like like I said before, I, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, uh, and I, I try not to be, and I'm, I'm I'm definitely not the smartest guy in the room. So uh, Amy Majori is probably the biggest mentor and guide that I've had because she was my very, very first real estate coach in Fortune Builders uh, when I first started. And then uh, we, after the, you know, the coaching piece ended and our business kind of took off because of her, um, you know, we, we kind of lost touch. And then a couple years later, probably five years later, I saw her on social media. I was like, holy crap. I told my wife, that's Amy. You know, and so I started reaching out to her and stalking her on social media and asking her, hey, what, what, the, what are you doing now? And she's like, oh, I'm doing something totally different. So she's probably the biggest mentor and just someone that has changed my life personally uh, that I am in debt to. So I, I can't speak in a positive about Amy. Uh, fortune builders in addition to Amy, because they have such a huge community. So, um, you know, that the curriculum in general helped me a ton, but just meeting everybody in fortune builders and meeting everybody in RPM. And I can't wait to meet folks in, in your uh, group as well, because they're probably the same caliber. Right. Um, but I've also done some subject to stuff with Travis Oglesby. 
Uh, you know, we've worked together quite a bit, and I know he's a, a uh, he's big with Pace, uh, Pace Morby and whatnot too. Um, but and then Jen and Stacy Conkey, man, those two ladies, they do uh, yeah. the remote remote uh, multifamily um, investing academy. Are, you know, they they are great. Are they in Ohio? Uh, they're uh, they're actually they actually live in Florida, but a lot of their investments are nationwide. So they they're big in Indianapolis, but. Um, they used to be in San Diego, and then they moved to Florida. But those two ladies talk about some power ladies, right? With Amy, Jen, and Stacy, those three ladies—they've uh, done something right, man. They're killing it. So, uh, my good friend Peter Yim, Peter, you're on with Chris Chapa. What's your question? Oh, hi, Chris. Nice to meet you. Hey, Peter. How are you? Nice meeting you. Good. Good. Uh, just be very frankly, I never raised money before. I honestly, I never even ever asked my parents for money. I didn't know when I was a kid. I didn't either, man. We're in the same boat. So raising money is like totally foreign to me. Okay. But nevertheless, um, if, if this was you, how would you structure this? If you got a subject to deal and the exit strategy will be uh, wrapping that deal and you had an investor come in with an entry fee, uh, how would you structure that? That's a good question, man. Uh, so the I'll give you two examples because we just did two of these and both of them are subject to. So one of the subject twos uh, was I got it from a wholesaler again. Um, it was a higher entry fee. So it needed uh, $45,000 to $50,000 to come in to pay off the rears and closing costs and all that stuff. So what I did was I went and actually found a private money lender and I said, hey, here's the deal I have uh, for fifty k. I will make you a 50-50 partner. And basically what that means is they're going to get 50% of the cash flow, 50% of the equity, and 50% of the depreciation. So we formed an LLC. Um, they're on the LLC. The LLC bought the property. We put it into a trust. We turned around and wrapped it. Our monthly payment is a little under $683. Um, and then we wrapped it and sold it in a trust. And uh, the monthly payment is $1,850. So um, the private money lender gets to share in that about eleven to twelve hundred dollar delta every year, um, and then obviously we get he gets all the same benefits that I get. Actually, that one's fifty one forty nine because I wanted to make sure somebody had the ability to make a decision. Um, but essentially, I look at it as fifty fifty. So they came in with the finances, uh, and I gave them half the property. And everyone says, "Wow, that's a lot of equity." It is, but I'm out of my pocket zero dollars, and I now have monthly cash flow. And I own a subject too, and I was able to give somebody else the uh, the dream of home ownership that could not afford it normally. Uh, the second way I did it was uh, this was an actual cop that I invested with. So he and his wife didn't have that money much money to invest, but they wanted to invest. So in St. Louis, uh, I picked up a home, and it was only uh, I gave five thousand dollars walk away uh, to the seller. Um, we bought it in a trust. What I did was I needed ten k at closing. So I borrowed 10K from a private money lender. I'm paying him 12% interest for 12 months. And then he has no ownership share. He's literally just a private money lender. And at 12 months, um, I will actually pay him out either with another lender or it'll be my money um, from a down payment. And so actually, I just wrapped that. It's in contract now uh, to be resold. For, so I signed it A to B in a trust. And now I'm selling it B to C in a trust. And the down payment is going to be somewhere around 6K. Um, and so that's literally almost, you know, that's six of the 10K that I have to repay that will sit in the bank and, and generate interest. Um, and so now I only got to find 4K to pay him back in the, at the end of 12 months. So he's literally just a PML for 12%. And then now I, know, I own another subject, too, that is going to bring in about $532 a month. Wow. Excellent. So two different ways to structure it. One, you can partner with them. Or two, you could just use them as a just use them as a private money lender, knowing that at the end of the year you're going to have to come up with that money, or another subject two's down payment is going to actually pay for that for me. And how do you determine that it, one strategy versus the other strategy? Uh, basically, it's depending on the lender, right? If okay. the lender is cool with leaving their money in there for, you know, 24, 36 months, five years, seven years, or the life of the loan. Uh, it, it just depends on what their goals are for their money and the amount of money too. Okay. Well, 
if I was a private man in the lender, the 50 50 sounds a lot more attractive than the 12%. It, right? it does, but you're going to have to come in with more money though. Um, you know, so okay. those, those I reserve to the, to the, to the ones that need more money. Ah, I see. Okay. The, the higher amount entry fee. Yeah. The higher dollar oh. amount, uh, obviously I got to make it worth their while. Right. So if I'm asking them to come in with 30 K or $40,000, I got to make it worth their while, right? Because, you know, I don't want to pay them back in 12 months. But if you wrap it, you might be able to pay most of that back. Mm -hmm. right? But the best part about being a partnership is so on the, the South Carolina subject too, where we are literally 51, 49 and a half partners, we got a $15,000 down payment. We uh -huh. split it. We split it 50, 50. Oh, okay. So I, I not only did come in with zero, I got 7,500 at closing. So I walked oh, away wow. making money and making a positive cash flow each month of about oh, wow. 500 bucks a month or so, if not more. I see. So you're continuing until that rap buyer pays that loan off, you're going to be yep. being paid that. Yep. that Till infinity. Coming. And it's an infinity, infinity return for me because I came in with nothing. Nothing, right? Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah, but okay, private money lending, dude, it was it was it was foreign to me, Peter. I didn't know how to do it either. It, seven months ago, I sat right where you sat, and I was like, dude, there's no way I can raise private money, no yeah. chance. Like, I'm not going to go ask my friends and my family for private money lending, you know. But it's a mindset shift because uh, JJ knows this, right? It's a mindset thing. It's uh, I'm not asking you for money. I have an opportunity for you to make 15 percent. I have an opportunity for you to own a rental and not be a landlord and get $600 a month for just lending me your money, right? So I'm, I don't ask people for money. Uh, I don't need your money. Um, I got plenty of people that want to earn double digits. So it, it's a mindset thing. I have an opportunity. If you don't want it, that's okay. Somebody else does. So uh, just change your mindset, Peter, and, and you can do exactly what I'm doing, dude. I'm I'm not doing anything special. Mr. Gail Andrew, you are on with Chris Ciampa. What's your question, Gail? Chris, you mentioned uh, partnering with people. I'm curious what kind of docs you're using there, uh, if any. Um, uh, yep, good question. So uh, we always do everything on the up and up. So um, if I partner with them on a long term, like the South Carolina deal that we talked about, we formed an LLC. So me and the investor are actually both on the LLC documents uh, that purchased the property. And so they're on the insurance, they're on the LLC that's on the deed, everything. So that's how we do it when we partner with them. From a private money lending standpoint, I do the same thing I mentioned earlier. So I do a promissory note, and then they have a lien position as well. That way, if anything were to happen to me, they have a lien position that they can uh, put on the house. So I, there's basically, I can't do anything with that house until they're notified and their debt's taken care of. And uh, everybody's always on the insurance. So on the uh, on the risk insurance or the homeowner's insurance partner with them long term yet because you don't know them. Uh, what would you do for a joint venture? Uh, joint ventures, I've done a few of those. So joint ventures kind of been the same thing, like most of the time what we've done for our apartment complex. So my LLC, let's pretend like you and JJ and I are all partners. All three of us go in and we're partners. Um, all three of our LLCs, we would we would do a joint venture agreement through our attorney and all three of us would. Uh, would have a joint venture agreement signed and all of our companies would be part of that joint venture agreement. And it would spell out exactly what our roles are because we each would have the role to play. Okay. And, and, and an attorney document. Okay. I was wondering if there yeah. was something you can somewhere or something, but uh, uh, I, yeah, no, I, I've got a few that I've used that my attorney have, has drafted up and, you know, by all means, I'm not an attorney. Uh, so if you're going to do a joint venture agreement, check with your attorney on what's best for you and, and the deal. But, um, yeah, that's what we've done in the past. We've we've sought out an attorney and and drafted up a, a joint venture agreement with all the businesses and LLCs listed with their roles in it. Okay, so uh, you, you just mentioned apartments. Um, how big can you go with these joint ventures on on these apartments? I mean, at a certain point, aren't you going to have to do like a syndication or something and actually um, more or less go through the SEC rules? Yep, absolutely. So uh, a lot of our stuff are small. They're duplex, triplex, and quads, right? Oh. Um, so uh, we've got one that's um, uh, the one we bought was one point. We paid 1.1 million for it. We put 200K into it, but there's only three of us 
uh, we were able to get some creative financing. So we got some seller financing, uh, we got some bank financing, and then we each had to come in with some money as well. And so there's only three of us on the deal. So uh, anything more than that, and you're probably going to have to start going down the fund and syndication path. Um, so you're not in violation with the SEC. But again, all that you can check with Nick McGrew and whoever you work with from a SEC attorney, not not me. But yeah, I mean, at, at some point, if you're going big, big, you know, you, you have to start doing the syndication. So you're compliant. Cool. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you got it. Thank you. Cynthia, you are back with another question for Chris. Okay, it's a short question. Okay, I'm a so short guy, fire will. Oh, look at you. Chris said he picked up a property up under a trust, added a partner, and then wrapped it up under a trust. But it's still your deal with a partner, right? Okay. Yep. Is is that you didn't wrap it, you didn't find a buyer and wrapped it, you kept it, and then you guys divided it 50, you know, you, you did your exit strategy with it. You still got nope. the ownership of it. We did both. So we, we actually wrapped it. So the A to B, the A to B purchase, uh, our, our LOC bought it, and then we came into an attorney, and they put it into a trust, right? And then what we did is we wrapped the mortgage in that trust, and our company is still in that trust, right? So now you and me formed a company, but our company is a beneficiary of that trust. And then we wrapped it and sold it to a, a, a buyer oh. who now has become the primary beneficiary of the trust, right? And so they're the ones making payments into the contract of the trust. And that house, you know, they get all the benefits of a homeowner, as you know, when you wrap it in the trust, right? So I don't have to go into that, but um, yeah, so... We we actually sold it and wrapped it, and so okay. the cash flow is now being split. Okay, okay. I I would I didn't quite understand that, but thank you yep. for explaining that. Yep. Never, never. Cynthia, thank you so much again. You're you are great. Thank you. You are awesome, girlfriend. Yeah. Thanks for the platform. <laughs> for the platform. Freddie Rivera, you are on with Chris Ciampa. What's your question? Uh, thanks, JJ. Chris, you're hilarious. Uh, and thanks for all this information. I like your, I like <laughs> thanks, your haircut, bro. too. I like your haircut. Three guys. Hey, that's uh, right, dude. Hey, that's right. Hey, you look uh, good, dude. So, look good. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, I'm a little bit earlier on in like raising capital, you know, but uh, it's all journey. Um, when you're talking to private money lenders or anyone you're partnering with, what are you asking? What are you looking for? And then what makes you just kind of run the other way and politely say like, no, thanks, but thanks. Like, just kind of walk me through that if that's something that you know you could kind of share. Right. And, uh, that's the beauty of real estate, right? We get to pick and choose who we work with. JJ and I have talked about this before, right? So uh, I'm, I'm attracted to people that want to be in this business. They want to learn more. Um, I'm not attracted to people that this is all about the numbers. If this is literally you trying to squeeze one or two extra points out of me or out of the investor or out of the deal, uh, I'm sorry, this isn't the right opportunity for you. So um, I'm, I'm in it. To, so my goal when I raise private money is to help the cops, right? Or to help whoever I'm, uh, in, they're entrusting their money and their trust of who I'm going to put them in touch with. That's my goal. So uh, I, I don't, it's not about the money for me. It's more about people understanding and getting educated and working with the right people. So that's why I only work with three, four people that I know and I trust and I would let them watch my kids and I would give them my money and know that they're going to trust it like their own. So to answer your question, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for somebody that wants that same thing. I'm looking for somebody that wants to better their life, but not at the expense of somebody else. Um, I'm not looking for somebody that's going to call me every single day and say, hey, what's the update on my money? I'm going to come look at the house and I want you to put this countertop and this countertop and I'm doing my own research. Um, that's not what you're here for, man. You're here to be a private money lender. I'm the expert in the real estate. You're the expert in giving me your money. So if if you can't handle that, then unfortunately, this isn't a good fit. There are plenty of other investors that will take your money. So I'm looking for somebody that has the same goal that I do and the same values that I do. Um, and I'm not looking for somebody to micromanage. I'm not looking for somebody that's going to be all up in my business about what I need to do. Um, you know, I really want you to sit back on the beach and earn your 15%, and I will keep you informed of the good and the bad and the timeline, and then I'll send you a fat check at the end. Does that make sense? Did that answer it, Freddie? 
That makes perfect sense. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Chris. Appreciate it. All right, thank you for joining us. Looks like we're uh, all going to the same barber here. Here we go. <laughs> well, God only made a few perfect heads. The rest he put hair on. There you go. We got Cece coming on for us. Here, here she comes. You know what, Cece? We can hear you, girl. Why don't you go ahead and just throw your question out there? Yeah, definitely. Uh, Chris, uh, thanks for coming on. Um, obviously, uh, an intriguing topic uh, for us all. So I'm going to kind of go a little basic here. Um, I guess one of the things that um, is kind of like a fear for me when going to someone, you know, who's lending is um, um, how do you what kind of uh, questions uh, do you ask them to even feel out uh, what type of return or what type of can you kind of does that make sense? Can you kind of give us an idea of how that conversation I know these are folks that, you know, so you already have that comfort level with them. But how do you even initiate that conversation to figure out what would work for them? And and are these, so, and I'm sorry, <laughs> are they That's sophisticated exactly. enough to know what they want, right? No, a absolutely. And uh, that's a good question because a lot of them, uh, they're educated, but they're not educated, if that makes sense, right? And so a lot of the folks I talk to, um, a lot of them I know, but a lot of them are references of people that I do know. And so I don't know them specifically, right? Like I know you now, but I don't really know you. So um, when we get on the phone, we, we literally, I just educate them on the process. This is how the process in general works, right? I have a group of investors, three or four of them that I work with on a routine basis that have these opportunities. And these opportunities vary from a rehab to a long-term rental to uh, a small duplex or triplex or quad. Uh, like I said, the majority of them are rehabs and flips, you know, or or quick turns on your money. When I say quick turn, I mean anything under 12 months, right? Um, so I, I'm not asking them. They're usually seeking me out based on what they've seen or heard. And I'm just explaining the process to them. And then, again, like I mentioned, I, I ask like you, I would ask you, Cece, what's your what's your goal, right? What are you looking to do? Where do you want to be in two years, three years? five years, right? Where do you see yourself investing? Do you want to be a landlord? Do you want to do the things that I'm doing? Or would you just rather lend money, kick back on the beach and earn double digit returns, right? And so a lot of people just need to be educated on the difference between what happens to your money when it sits in the bank. Um, how do I borrow against my 401k? I didn't know I could even do that. So just connecting them with the right resources to understand that there's more ways to be a private money lender than just having cash sitting in your bank, right? There's life insurance policies, there's inheritance, there's you know lawsuit money, there's uh, health savings accounts, there's self-directed 401ks, there's IRA. So everybody just thinks of money and traditionally like, dude, I don't have 50K lying in my bank, right? That I can just give you. Um, so, but a lot of people do have these alternative assets like a HELOC or anything else that they can borrow against and use that to invest and earn double digit returns. So it's really just educating them on the different ways they can invest and what kind of returns they can see and what protections I'm giving you, right? Because everyone says, oh, it's risky. Uh, there's risk in everything, man. There's risk in walking down the street. There's risk every day when I put my uniform on, but that doesn't stop me from doing it. Because I just I get educated on how I mitigate that risk, right? Uh, when I put my uniform on as a cop every day, there's risk. There's a lot of risk. But my training mitigates that risk. How I respond mitigates that risk. Who I respond with mitigates that risk. And real estate is no different, right? When the control of something goes up, the risk goes down, right? And this is what I've learned from very smart people, including Amy Majuri and Sean McNicholas, right, uh, is that an investor that you trust and is credible, that's the key, and, and actually lives up to the same values that you do, not just me, that but your values and matches your goals, you know, they can control what they buy a house for. They can control what rehab budget is. They necessarily can't control the market, but when you buy it so low, you can control the price that hedges for whatever market we're in. Um, so... You know, that's that's one of the things that I just help educate them. And then 
obviously the elephant in the room is I always ask him like, if you were to be an investor today, you know, how much, how much do you think you have to invest? Right. And then that kind of lets me know and it lets them know like, Hey, we either need to work to get you here or, you know, you have all this money somewhere else. Let's get you to somebody that can actually help you put that into a 401k or an IRA or a Roth IRA, something you can, you know, invest out of and then have it come back in tax free. Right. Cause I'm not that expert, but I work with experts that can show you that landscape. So I'm not asking him for anything. I'm just showing them the opportunity and whether they take it or not, that's up to them. And I can educate them on the different ways to do it. And some of the examples that I currently have for them and what opportunities right now look like, and then it's up to them if they want to take it. So I'm not asking them for anything. And so that conversation for me is not awkward at all. Now, if I sit in a cafe and I'm asking you, CC, like, hey, can I borrow five bucks so I can go buy a burrito? That's an awkward conversation. Mm -hmm. um, but if I'm telling you what, what I've got, it's not awkward for me at all. Yeah. And, and like you said, um, I, I think I heard you say that you have people seeking you out. So they probably have some idea of what kind of return they want or if they want to yep. be, um, you know, more a partner versus a, um, a lender. Um, Absolutely. And I deal with a lot of people that don't. I deal with a lot of people that have never been in the real estate space at all, but they're just interested in hearing, right? How do I make five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars, twenty thousand dollars extra a year? Yes, that's those are the people that are that I'm running across regularly yep. right just now. Just educate them. Just educate them. Just have a conversation, and you don't need to talk all details and have all the deal information. Just give them the overall. Hey, this is what private money lending is, right? And this is this is how it works. Do you think I need to be, because I haven't lent, I haven't been a lender. Do you think I need to go through that process first myself to understand it so I can talk? No? No, I, I had not. Um, uh, actually, that, that's a lie. I had, but on a very small level, um, you know, like $10,000 and it's frightening, right? So it, it's terrifying the first time you send somebody that even though you know and trust, right? It's like, I'm sending you $10,000 That's or $50,000 or $100,000. That's a big step for some people. And some people have a different threshold for risk and tolerance. Uh, so, so some people, it's not a big problem at all. But for me, it, I'm conservative. So when I first started doing lending myself, you know, it was terrifying. You know, and then you feel good about it. You're like, yeah, this is cool. Like, I'm going to make this much money. And then, you know, two or three months in, you're like, holy crap, where's my money? Like, how come my money's not coming back to me? And you're like, well, it's only been a, it's only been 90 days. Uh, he said it's going to be six months, right? And then lo and behold, five months down the road and you get a phone call and you get updates and you start to feel a little better. Okay, cool. It's coming along. And then all of a sudden you get a little note that says, hey, where do you want me to send your wire? And that's the greatest day in the world, right? It's better than Christmas. Um, and then you want to do it again and again and again, right? So uh, the answer is I don't – think you need to do it. This is my opinion. I don't, I don't know that you need to do it, but you absolutely need to be very educated on the process and how it works and who you're working with um, in order for people to take it seriously. Absolutely. All right. Thank Appreciate you. Sullivan Smith, you're on with Chris Jumpa. Hi, Chris. Hey, Thank Sabella, you. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for this. And first, let me say, we just appreciate your service. You know, a lot of times people do not talk about um, how much policemen, first responders do. And um, so I first wanted to thank you for, for doing that. Secondly, I wanted to talk to you about a little more. Um, what do you think? Well, I had so many questions. Okay. So they're all <laughs> rumbling around in my head now. Cool. Um, Let's do it. But uh, one of the things I, I just was listening to CC say this, you know, you know, how do you learn? And I found that problem. I've been lending for five years. And um, one of the things is that people, you know, don't know, don't understand, you know, the process of getting into lending. Um, and so, CC, one thing I, I'll offer, give me a call. I'll be happy to talk to you. It's fun. And I love the returns. Love it. Okay. Um, do you, um, when you're putting together, um, someone, someone say you've not known for a while, or, you know, you've met, like we've met, we've, I've seen each other, we've waved stuff, yep. but we haven't 
formed a relationship. And I've gotten to this point when JJ talks about do the relationship first. That, and that's what I do when I'm teaching. I'm a teacher by trade originally. Thank you for that. My and, mom was a teacher for 20 years. So yeah. much kudos to you as well. And um, so I, I'm about teaching. And so what I've been doing is this private money lending, consulting, if you will, concierge service type of thing um, to help others learn about how to set things up, how to make sure their finances are in good shape. And the other piece is I've been asking folks in their promissory note, I suggest that they do um, deed in lieu of foreclosure. What's your thought about making that part of your notes? I, I, don't, I don't have any problem with it because if I work with somebody like yourself uh, that is a lender of mine and that's what gives you the comfort to do that, then I'm going to give you every comfort in the world, right? And mm -hmm. I always advise you got to be comfortable with it. And if you don't like my promissory note, then have it reviewed by your attorney and let's exactly. fix it so you are comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. uh, because if I'm confident in my investment, uh, I'll do anything for you, right? Because I want to make sure that you come back and lend with me again. So if that means I add that clause in, great. We add the clause in because you know what? Uh, I'll stand by my investment and I'll stand by my numbers and I'll stand by you to make sure you get your return. So I, I got no problem with that. Let's add yeah. in whatever clause you want. Well, but the other side of this is not just the one side about the private lender. It's also about our, my, the investor. Let's say something catastrophic happens and your family is thrown in total disarray just because something happened. And now they have to work about getting through foreclosure. So I look at it on two levels. It's not about just the private money lender, but it's about the investor because you trust i really trust the investors one because by the time i finish vetting i know i want to do it i know they're prepared to do it and for anyone who's interested i would always say start with individuals who have experience absolutely which I, is why i work with three and four individuals and there's a fifth coming on board that we're vetting that uh, if, if I don't know you, I'm not going to send you people that I that trust me, right? Because my reputation's on the line um, and I need to know those investors are in a good spot, right? And I don't just send them your way. So like okay. if you told me today that, hey, Chris, I want to invest. Okay, I don't just send you to JJ and say, here, JJ, here's her phone number, give her a call. No, right. we're mm -hmm. going to get on a couple of Zoom calls with all three of us. And we're going to build a relationship first. So mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to share with JJ how I know you, what our background is, what we've talked about and what we've discussed. And oh, by the way, before the conversation, I'm going to talk to you about how I know JJ, what yep. JJ is all about and what our relationship is. So, you know, and then all three of us get on the phone and all three of us can be ourselves and we can form a new relationship and partnership. So that's how I do it. That's what's been successful for me. Other people do it totally different, but that's how I do it. Well, you and I are twins because that's how <laughs> I <laughs> You got more hair than me. I don't know. We're twins, but you're probably better looking. Well, I, it barely, barely, but, yeah, uh, but you're much that's better looking than choice. I am, So I, I'll take the compliment and I appreciate it. But yes, but you know, that that's the thing is building the relationship and that's the piece. I always call it build a relationship. And then once we feel comfortable, if I will lend to someone, then I would recommend them to someone else. Well, Chris, I think we can wrap up just about now. We we'll go to the breakout rooms because I know we got people wanting to network and get some more questions from you. Um, but if people want to reach out to you, they've got questions about lending. They want to lend with you. They want to just bounce a couple things off you. Uh, do you have a website, your MySpace page, TikTok? Uh... <laughs> My Red Book page? Yeah, so I mean, I, I got all of that. So the, the easiest way is, is probably my cell phone. You can I'll give you my personal number. I don't care. It's 916-206-9922. Uh, my email address is my first name. It's Chris, C-H-R-A-S, at, and it's a long one, bluelinehomesolutions.com. Text or email, easiest way to get a hold of me. My website is uh, private money returns forward slash Chris. If you go to that, that's my uh, that's my Blue Line Capital private money website. So you can hit me up there too. So a myriad of ways you can get me. Hey, um, I got one last question for you. Um, 
my group's a networking group, and I talk about the importance of networking all the time, probably to the point where people are like, he's doing it again, talking head. Um, but from your standpoint of a real estate investor, successful real estate investor, uh, dealing with tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions, um, every real estate education platform has a Facebook page for their community. Amy Mitchell is raising private money, pays more to be said too, fortune builders community. Um, and a lot of investors coming to these communities, some are brand new to real estate investment, some are experienced investors, but they're coming into the social media platform for real estate for the first time. For these people, a lot of them are just chasing the deal. What is the importance of networking and using social media to network, if not also joining a group like mine? Uh, so it, it's been a, an interesting transition for me because I, I was I spent a lot of years chasing the deal. Um, and then, you know, as you start getting in the room with smarter people and people that have been successful and are where you want to be, um, you quickly find out that you got to get out of your comfort zone, which was for me the biggest change that I had to make mindset wise is, uh, believe it or not, I am an introvert until I get to know you. Uh, I have a lively personality. I'm full of life. I love what I do. I love my cop job. I love my real estate job. Um, you know, I have a passion for both of those. But your network, man, they truly say it. Your network is your net worth. And if you're not talking to people, you're not doing it the right the right way. Um, you can chase the deal all you want, but it's not going to get you to where you want to be, right? So being in the room, talking to other people, getting other people's perspectives. They don't even have to be smarter than you, right? I uh, everybody's smarter than me, but you know, I learned something from everybody I talk to because everybody does this business differently. Right. So, um, that that's been the biggest thing for me is breaking out of my shell because cops, you know, they don't want to be on social media. They don't want people to know they were a cop. Um, I'm proud to be a cop. You know, I was, I was a human, a dad, a husband, a friend before I became a cop. So I don't live and breathe this. It's just, it happens to be a job that I thoroughly love but it doesn't define who I am. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm out there. I put myself out there and I love talking with people. I love engaging with people. So, you know, hit me up. I, I don't, I don't care. You're not wasting my time. I'm not too busy for you, but that's how I learn. That's how I get better. And that's how I get deals. So, you know, just talking to people, all of a sudden, you never know uh, two months down the road, someone comes to you with a deal and says, Hey, I got a deal. Are you interested? And that's what it's all about for me. Just meeting new people. I mean, I, I freaking love you, brother. You got a heart of gold. You're a great person. You're genuine. It's a pleasure for me to call you a friend. And that's, that's absolutely, man. Thank you. I, I call you one as well, dude. So being on here is, is a gift. So I just appreciate it. Yeah. We're, we're, and we're fortunate to have you today because they, they caught the bad guy today, right? Yes, they did catch the bad guy today. So yeah, there was, it was a little touch and go there for a minute, whether I was going to be here or not. I was calling JJ right around 11, 1115 going, dude, I'm, I got my lights and siren. I don't have a siren anymore because I'm the PIO. So uh, they say I'm not really a cop anymore. Um, but uh, you know, I was driving fast trying to get to a trying to get to a scene that we have, we're dealing with, and luckily, uh, right at the nick of time, we caught him. So uh, I got to be here. So I'm blessed. So thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, that's a great story. Um, so yeah, hang, hang on tight. We're gonna go to the breakout rooms. If you guys are watching on YouTube right now, please like Chris's video. Please put some notes down into the comment section, what your takeaways were, what you liked. Um, that's going to help the video and and, and and help us as well. Um, if you guys are on the call, stick around. We're going to go to the breakout rooms. Again, to connect with Chris, that would be through his Instagram. Share that one more time. Do a screenshot here for your Instagram. And uh, if you want to connect with me, uh, look for my website, jjazizian.com. Little button that says register now. Click that to join the group. I want to thank everybody on the call right now. And if you're watching, look for us to have more uh, more product coming your way. So, Chris, I guess we'll see them in the future, right? Yeah, absolutely, man. Thanks for having me. Peace out, everybody. It was, it was a blast. Hit me up. If you're on the call, guys, stick around. Don't go away.